Don't like I injure myself uh, unless I'm carrying survival gear. Um, the basic one, of course, is a big stick, which you're constantly checking the ground all the time in front of you. And I think it's important to realise that the salmon, once it comes into fresh water, is completely dependent on our cooperation by virtue of the fact that if we pollute the waters, either by chemicals or by fertilizers on the land, it will end up in the water table and directly into the river system. The Gara was a, of a huge resource for the salmon fisheries uh, of the Lee. Yeah, well, I suppose my connection with water, streams, rivers, probably began when I was as young as five or six years of age. My friends and I would go to a little stream that ran behind our housing estate and we'd take glass milk bottles down to catch little fish called sticklebacks. And we'd make up nets from old netted curtains and sticks and anything that we could fashion into a net to catch these little fish. And I have a vivid memory of, in particular, the male fish had a red breast and it was a like a trophy fish even at that stage if one of us got the red breasted male it was like your day was made and it was worth ten of anything else and even at that young age five or six years of age it, it was an adventure it was a big 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 cause for excitement and, and celebration Gara means uh, a wooded river and it was quite unique in that it is more correct to describe it as a post-glacial alluvial forest which means it goes back to the time of the end of the last ice age. When I was 12 or 13 years of age myself and my friends were then old enough to walk or cycle to the Glashaboy River a few miles away and the glacier boy runs through a little village called Glanmoyer, which is on the east of Cork City. But what was actually happening here by comparison is we were now going to an actual river, a proper river. Because now you were dealing with trout, and the trout were multiples the size of the sticklebacks and you know the river was within distance of us uh, to get each day. The Glashaboy is east of Cork City, it's a tributary of the Lee and it was where I basically spent all my spare time during summer holidays, seven days a week we more or less lived on the river. It was, it was just an all-consuming passion. At that time uh, when the ice finally melted away the entire country became a huge, vast uh, oak elm forest. Over the centuries, all of that has been completely destroyed. The only part that actually survived was the Gera. So what we have here is we have a scale model of the River Lee and Cork Harbour to give people a clear understanding of exactly what's happening when the salmon are returning to fresh water to spawn. As you can see this large area of, of blue represents the second largest natural harbour in the world which is quite interesting when you consider Ireland is a very very small country 
as the salmon are coming back into fresh water at this stage you know they've just got a single minded mission and that is to spawn to reproduce the next generation it's an instinctive drive it's an overwhelming drive it's an irresistible drive in many cases the salmon have been at sea for one or two winters and this cycle happens all year round but there's particular times of the year when the run of salmon would be more than at others. For example, salmon returning in February, March, April would be considered spring run salmon. And these salmon usually have spent two winters at sea. Whereas the, the salmon that are running during the summer months have usually spent one winter at sea, having in both cases come from as far away as Greenland. As they come into Cork Harbour, they can now smell the River Lee, which is the, the journey that we're primarily talking about, and they'll move up often on a filling tide. So they're coming into the harbour, the salt water is denser than the fresh water, so it doesn't actually mix, so there is a separation. So the salmon will often use the, the surge from the tide to help them to surf up the harbour, at the same time detecting the fresh water ahead of them. As they come up past the famous town of Cove, they come up approaching uh, the city itself, which is represented here by the, the shaded area. Before they get to Cork City, a significant tributary which flows into the estuarine part of the River Lee is the Glasherboy River. And that's particularly significant from my point of view because this is where my association with fresh water, beginning with brown trout and sea trout and, and following on into salmon, began. The Glasherboy is uh, a fantastic sea trout river and it also carries a good stock of uh, salmon, particularly spawning uh, late run fish. To be honest with you, I had such a passion for angling that I used to dream about catching fish. I used to dream about epic battles with monster trout and more often than not you wouldn't get the fish. The fish would escape and you wouldn't get the accolade of, you know, showing everybody your magnificent prize and getting the, the pat on the back for this magnificent uh, creature. The reality of it was that it was a dream and you'd wake up with a start but it would leave you with a feeling almost like a nightmare. You would have the, the recollection in vivid multicolour detail of this big long fight but there was no reality and it was just a dream. There comes a point for the salmon in its journey where it now is 100% reliant on our cooperation. And you might think, why is that? Well, quite simply, the rivers are corridors through modern communities. If that water is polluted or in any way interfered with by us, the consequences for the salmon can be fatal. So that's the pollution factor. The water has to stay within very, very tight parameters for the fish to be able to survive. Well, I was born in 54, uh, when it was actually being cut down. So um, that went on for about a year or two into 56. Um, and I just had vague glimpses of it, but nothing very concrete. But what basically happened was we've come out of the Second World War. You talk about economic depression, recession, the same old thing that we all know about today. It was, it was just as bad, if not worse. And obviously to try and boost the economy, there was a whole lot of initiatives looked at, and we needed electricity. And um, we couldn't afford to be buying oil at the time, probably. Um, Torf only provided so much. So the whole idea of hydroelectric dams seemed to be the answer. Someone came up with the idea and everyone stopped thinking after that and the projects were just bulldozed through. So we got Arden Crush on the Shannon and it was reasonably successful. And that of course whetted their appetites, the developers of the day, the entrep entrepreneurs of the day, whatever you want to call them. Um, and we dammed the Lee. And they built the first dam in Ascara, just up from the city which backed all the ways up as far as the village of Carrig Drogheda. And that's the main dam. But I just thought then, you know, we'd double our water supply if we built a second one, 
acting as a reservoir which would flood all the lead from Carrigadraha right up to here. And um, they then thought a third one would be built at Dromcarra, which would flood it all the way back, to, back into Ballingiori. So the entire valley would have been lost. Um, so the scheme um, obviously seemed to be a very good thing at the time. Electricity, jobs, um, economic development. So it would have been very, very hard to argue uh, against it. And environmentalism wouldn't have been uh, even known about in, in those days. Obviously to, to get the dams up and running, a lot of work had to be done and the biggest problem was with the Gera. We talk about thousands of acres of ancient woodland and this is all going to flood and if we leave it standing, it's all going to die and you'll just be looking at this ghost forest forevermore poking up out of the reservoir, which didn't uh, sound very attractive and so I decided to cut the whole thing down, we clear fell it and at least then we get all the trees out and there wouldn't be this constant debris of trees falling and getting washed down and blocking the dam and interfering with the turbines. So they spent quite a lot of time at it and um, practically every single tree here was cut down. Um, I, I wouldn't argue with percentages, I would say it was almost completely clear felled except for a few trees up near the top, some which were quite massive and it was impossible to cut them down at the time. So the salmon that are destined to travel up the River Lee bypass the Glashaboy River and they're moving now into Cork City itself as you can see here represented by the shaded area. This section here on the map is known as the docks and this is where the commercial ships are loading and unloading cargo and you can see this area here where the river, the river clearly separates. Well the salmon, when it's at sea, obviously has the freedom more or less to go where it wants, where, the, where, where it can get its, its, its food etc. However when it comes back from the sea it's now moving back into the freshwater rivers and if you consider the, the River Lee system and, and the Lee Harbour, which is one of the largest natural harbours in the world. It, it, it's a large area for the fish to come into. However, they're genetically programmed with a, a homing instinct to find the river that they originally came from. And eventually that this avenue of access increasingly narrows until eventually they'll find themselves literally in a freshwater stretch. And if you picture in your mind's eye as they approach Cork City, they can actually take the South Channel or they can take the North Channel, two channels that divide the city. In, in many cities and towns, well, you can see clearly here that people that live north of the river, the north siders, and the people that live south of the river are south siders. And in, in the case of Cork City, we also have, you know, people that call themselves middle parish because they're literally living in the, the middle of the, the city or in between both channels. Depending on where the strongest current has come from, the, the, the salmon will often follow the strongest current. So if there's more of a push, of fresh water coming down through the, the north channel, the salmon will follow, generally follow where the, the strongest fresh water influence is. February 1984 was the start of the salmon season uh, and as my 16th birthday approached I headed off on uh, my bicycle to the River Lee uh, below Anglers Rest Bridge and literally on the 26th of February 1984 I actually managed to catch my first salmon which for me was particularly, it was a life changing moment because there's no comparison really to the, the thrill and the exhilaration and the power and uh, it's hard to describe to a person who mightn't appreciate it but every, every sense in your body is tingling with excitement and joy and I literally sang the whole way home with this, the salmon you know, taped to the handlebars and uh, as I said the traffic lights at one particular point the salmon went flying off the handlebars and there was a guard on a motorcycle who pulled me in and, and, and checked my license. <laughs> 
But once he knew I was actually legit, he, he left me carry on in my way and I just went off, more or less singing the whole way home. As the salmon leave now, the salt water, they're coming into fresh water now. It's going to be entirely fresh water for the remainder of their upstream journey. And at the same time, as they leave the tide, they also encounter the first large man-made physical barrier, a part of the river known as the Lee Weir. Why this is important and significant is that not so much when there's plenty of water there and the salmon can easily negotiate the Lee Weir. It's usually in summertime when the water is low and there's very little going over the weir. The salmon often shoal below the weir in their hundreds uh, and that's where they can often be caught, which of course if they had an easy passage they wouldn't be caught. So it, it just proves that it is significant. They are delayed by a man-made barrier. In good conditions when there's plenty of water there and the salmon can overcome the weir, they'll then move upstream. And at this stage now, they come to a section of the river known as Angler's Rest. And Angler's Rest is another iconic section of the river and there's Angler's Rest Bridge, which is a, a, a very um, a prominent landmark on the river. The gear together added up to about 500 kilometres uh, of gravel beds, all in this vast inland delta. And therefore the salmon that actually spawned here would have been in their hundreds of thousands, if not millions. But probably even more important is the River Shornock. The River Shornock flows into the River Lee at Angler's Rest. And why the River Shornock is very important to the River Lee system is that wild Atlantic salmon can still travel up the River Shornock and carry out their life cycle as nature intended. So that the salmon going up and down the River Shornock are actually doing it as nature intended. And there's no artificial influence in that regard. The salmon in the Angler's Rest area are now at a place that would be referred to as the meetings. It's where two rivers meet and the salmon can distinguish from the scent within these rivers what direction they want to go. The salmon that are drawn towards the upper lee will move upstream towards an area known as Powder Mill Weir. This is another physical barrier. It's a man-made weir that once again, similar to the Lee Weir, the salmon will be delayed there in low water conditions. However, if there's enough water, the salmon can once again pass over the weir and move on upstream. They'll come to an area of the river there known on the right angle bend here as Inniscarra Graveyard where the River Bride flows in. And similar to the River Shornock, the River Bride is significant in that wild Atlantic salmon without any interference from man can actually move upstream into the River Bride and carry on reproduction as nature intended. So this natural process is taking place here once again and these salmon are genetically pure. Well if you consider or take seriously the idea that you're going after the king of fish then your preparation should reflect that. You must have an intimate knowledge of your equipment, the rods, the reels and know exactly what's going on with the gear. So that nothing can be left to chance. If you take Murphy's Law, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. And the last thing you want to happen is to be connected to a fish of a lifetime. And the line snap because you never changed it or it was poor quality or your hook was rusty or the handle fell off your reel. So that's just another aspect to the salmon fishing, the preparation of your equipment and knowing exactly how well it's prepared and how good it is. the actual economic loss to the area because it filled hotel after hotel. Um, the amount of buses, they used to come from the city out here and the whole lease system. Uh, they came from England, they came from Germany they, or Dutch uh, for the salmon run uh, every year. And uh, they were part and parcel of the countryside, the actual salmon fishermen. I'm um, the third generation here at the hotel. My parents were before me and my grandparents. 
Yeah, yeah the, the, the river really was, was a generator of, of, of tourism in the area. There were two hotels in Inchigila and uh, the hotel at Gugan Barra. And a lot of their off-season business was, was anglers. And it, it was such a, an unspoiled, beautiful area. And yet so close to uh, Cork that it was, it was very much uh, part of, of the living then. But, um, you know, and, and it gave so many more local people, as I said, Jim Lucy, the, the boatman, and many, many more people got, uh, you know, got a livelihood from it. And there was always this element of tourism uh, that followed this idea of angling in, in the area. And uh, hunting too, I suppose, there would have been growth shooting and so on, but the, the big visit here really was for the, the salmon angling. It was a favourite haunt for them before the, the dam and more or less the end of the salmon fishing then. In addition to that you then have the man-made obstacles and historically when you look back and you see mills and weirs, man-made obstructions on the river system. The onus is on us to keep those obstacles as minimal as possible so that the fish can proceed up the river to the natural the spawning reds where they can carry on with their life cycle. However, the reality on the river lee system is that this system isn't as good as it should be and many of the weirs and passes are over 100 years old the fish are at a disadvantage. However, the weirs aside, given the right water conditions, many of these weirs can be passed. The fish can throw itself up onto the weir, try and keep its chin pressed hard against the surface and drive itself almost like a rugby player to hold itself and in the right water conditions can power itself up over a weir or use some of the, the fish passes. By overcoming the two main weirs, one at Cork, the Lee, the Lee weir system, and then there's a weir in the Balancholic Regional Park also. The salmon that don't travel up the River Bride continue their journey up the River Lee, arriving at Inniscarra Dam. Inniscarra Dam is an impassable barrier. While there is a fish pass in place, a design known as the, the Borland Fish Pass, it's very much ineffective for a number of reasons, and primarily the fact that it's on a six hour time lock system and the salmon have to be inside in it for it to work. And these wild creatures have no way of knowing that they have to wait and be within a time frame. Um, I suppose to begin with, the stations were built in 1953 and they were commissioned in 1957. Um, so you have Atlantic salmon, for example, spawning above the stations. We have fish lifts of fish passes as such at both stations, one at Carragadrihid and one at Inniscarra. Uh, and in those fish passes are automatic fish counters so that when the fish come in and use those and they may go up and down and we have shown that that is the case. The Borland Fish Pass is uh, designed in such a way that when the salmon approaches it, there's basically a small little narrow tunnel. There's water flowing out from this tunnel. And as a result of that flow, the salmon may be attracted into that corridor. Once inside in it, a trapdoor closes behind the fish. And then the water fills up literally in a lift type system, like filling a bottle. And when it gets up to the top of the dam, another trapdoor opens and the salmon can swim out into the reservoir above the obstacle of the, the dam. But we would feel that certain fish do find the fish pass and do go up to it, and in fact, a percentage do come back down. The problem with the Borland fish pass is that 
it isn't in permanent operation. So if a salmon approaches the dam and the salmon is in full on running mode and the trap door happens to be closed, well, we don't know what effect that's going to have on the circuitry of the salmon in its own thought processes. It may literally turn around and go back downstream and literally the impulse for the fish to carry on upstream could be lost. It's on a six hour cycle, so four times per day. It's an automatic system. It's not manual, so it's, and we can change that to suit, uh, for example, if there's a big one of salmon, we might change it to six times per day. If the system was ideal and the salmon could pass at their will, the way they're genetically programmed to proceed upstream, to overcome all obstacles, if the Borland fish pass was ideal, then you wouldn't have a backlog of fish trapped below it. Salmon uh, survival is at a uh, fairly minimal at the present time, with the marine survival being very low. But on the River Lee, we have uh, probably in and around the region of between four or five hundred wild fish uh, utilising uh, those fish lifts, who are certainly well below the conservation limit, which is set at a national level for the River Lee. So we're a long way off restoring the, the wild salmon population on the Lee. People use the, the phrase the death of death of a thousand cuts uh, and hydroelectric is one of those cuts uh, and it's my job to make sure that that cut is minimised as much as possible which is why we also have a, a hatchery unit to compensate for the effects of hydroelectric generation. Five, six, five, six, 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 or in the hatchery, uh, they may be released as unfit fry, in other words, fish that are just hatched out of an egg. They haven't started feeding. Uh, summer par, autumn par, or pre smolts. Uh, and from that hatchery unit, we release uh, large numbers of salmon smolts uh, in between, say, 15 and 70,000 fin clipped fish per annum. Um, they are released to sea and they would come back as adult fish. Now we have a low survival rate, probably about maybe one and a half percent in around that kind of figure for hatchery fish going to sea. Uh, and that is a, it's not a commercial hatchery, it's a conservation hatchery. It's a tool to actually seed the area above the stations uh, to help actually restore the salmon, the wild salmon population above the stations.
From the point of view of uh, restoring a wild salmon population, it has limited success, you would say. Uh, you know, we have only about 500 wild fish per annum coming to the stations. Uh, so, obviously, we're, we have a mortality rate then of 8%, uh, and it's really because of that 8% that there is a fisheries conservation unit in ESB to compensate for those fish killed in turbines. When the salmon smoke comes to the station, they have an option to go to a turbine unit or to a fish lift. What we have here is a small little coarse fish. It would appear fairly normal. There doesn't appear to be any major damage to it. It would be my opinion that this fish here, its spine is broken. You can see that there's force here after being applied. And it looks like the fish's back is broken. And that would be indicate that it was in the turbines and the force has just literally killed it. A turbine is quite a big uh, machine as such. Uh, there are quite big blades but there's actually quite a big distance between those blades when it's operating at near maximum efficiency which is what we use for our smolt protocol when these fish are going to sea so that if you look at it there's actually a big gaps between the blades and salmon luckily are quite small fish when they migrate downstream so it's not uh, unusual as such for a, a 90 percent plus survival rate for those particular type of turbines and for a station of that head height but on the lee system uh, the only route for downstream passage is actually back through the fish lifts there's a trash screen at the entrance point to the turbine and that trash screen really, as its name suggests, is to keep trash, for example, plastic, or trees, tree trunks, or dead animals, whatever it is. It just keeps that away from the turbine. Uh, so if a salmon, an adult salmon, may get stuck on that screen if it's dead or alive, uh, but yeah, so when salmon move in freshwater, they spawn, male and female. Um, they would have spent quite a lot of their energy resources into their gonad development to produce eggs and milk. Uh, and generally they're in poor conditions, so the vast majority of those would actually die within freshwater. Um, a very small proportion would move downstream and they may come back as repeat spawners. So they will go back to sea, start feeding again, and the next year or two years later, they may come back and spawn again. For those salmon that do get up over Inniscarra Dam by means of the Borland Fish Pass, they are now introduced into Inniscarra Reservoir. And this reservoir is an artificial environment. The salmon can't spawn in here, it's deep water. Their sense of current detection has been taken away from them. And I can only imagine that they try and find their way upstream. And they may spend some time going around trying to find how do we get out of this lake yeah. before they get to sea. And unfortunately, there's very little uh, a company like ESB or internationally even uh, that you can do. Um, you do have water quality issues with the two reservoirs and this, the fact that the reservoirs are present, which would not be beneficial as such for migratory fish such as the salmon. And people are inclined to get confused by Inniscarra Dam and don't even bother thinking about Caragadruha Dam, which is just a duplication further upstream. Essentially, the system can't be considered as working properly until the wild Atlantic salmon can get up into the headwaters of the River Lee system, reproduce the next generation, and for the cycle to carry on back downstream, out to sea, in an unbroken chain. That can't be the case on the River Lee system at the moment. Nobody can claim it's the case at the moment. And there's a moral obligation on everybody and every interested party to do what's right. For those salmon that do manage to negotiate their way through in Escarra Reservoir, they now find themselves at the second dam on the River Lee system, that's Caragadruha Dam. And similarly so, it has a Borland fish pass. But once again, the salmon have no way of knowing the time mechanism for their up upstream journey. In addition to this, the hatchery for the salmon on the River Lee system is below Caragadroha Dam and we have no way of knowing that the salmon may 
think that they've reached home and they may not have an upstream urge to go beyond Caragadroha Dam. Once again with Caragadroha Dam, the second dam on the River Lee, if the salmon do manage to get over this dam, they once again find themselves in another reservoir, Caragadrohid Reservoir. As we've said already, this water is unnatural to the salmon, it's too deep and they can't use it for spawning. If they do negotiate their way through this reservoir, they now find themselves in a part of the River Lee system known as the Gera. And this was an inland freshwater delta that was very much damaged as a result of the backfilling from Caragadrohid Dam. I can imagine in my mind's eye, hundreds of years ago, that this part of the river would have been an ideal nursery for the juvenile salmon. Taking an overview then of the Gaira ecologically, um, it wasn't just the salmon itself and it wasn't maybe just was an oak forest, it, it was all the other huge biological diversity that was inside in it. And in all those gravel based um, streams, um, because they were overshadowed by the trees, um, there was very little vegetation on, on the, the river beds themselves. So it allowed a whole lot of other stuff to actually survive there. None more fascinating than the freshwater pearl mussel. And they covered vast sections of the beds. And these are quite unique. Um, and they're now a protected species because they're practically uh, heading for extinction. Um, and the reason they've died off on, on a large scale here on, on the Lee is because they needed the salmon. And the freshwater pearl mussel, which can live up to maybe 125 years, um, so a very, very long lifespan. But its uh, ability to, to reproduce is very delicate. When the salmon run comes, they release the eggs in the sperm, which when they're fertilized, the young little zooplankton type larvae has to attach onto the gills of the salmon, where it parasitizes it, feeding off the, the rich blood supply there. But it's very short term, and it doesn't do any harm to the salmon. And it's just the salmon continues upstream, and it keeps taking the young mussel uh, larvae up where they drop off into the fresh gravel beds again where the salmon is laying the eggs and the, the, the mussels grow up and in situ will stay there for 100, 125 years reproducing. Without the salmon um, the mussel has found it very difficult to reproduce. Trout don't fit the bill because they're not migratory enough uh, and travelling whole linser rivers uh, on the same scale as the salmon. So unfortunately all we're finding here now are just uh, very old uh, mussels. Um, it's very, very difficult to actually find any young baby mussels. They're practically non-existent. I mean, where people need to appreciate, we take it for granted, monofilament fishing line. You know, it's this almost invisible little strand. Uh, but the technology that's involved means that you can connect yourself to a powerful creature and you can feel this energy, the connection between you and the creature through technology. If there wasn't such a thing as fishing line, you wouldn't be able to do that. It's almost like an artificial spider's web. We've been able to tap into this, this use this technology to allow us now to have the same senses that a spider has when something is connected to its web. But we've used technology. You, you need to appreciate it and don't, don't take it for granted because it's, it's that special.
Um, the best way to describe it is a post-glacial alluvial forest, as I've said. But to emphasize how unique that, that is, there's only about three or four such places left on the planet. This is the only one left in Western Europe, west of the Rhine. Because east of the Rhine, there's a second one in the Czech Republic uh, on a river there, which is heavily industrialized, but it's still there. Um, there's a, another one, a third one, shall we say, in the Amazonian rainforest uh, on the Ecuadorian side, which I've gone to visit, and the similarities are actually incredible. Uh, all these islands again, and these forests, and these native dwellers living inside in it. Um, and there's one or two systems that are close to it in New Zealand, and that's it. That's how unique it is. So in a sense, it is one of the rarest habitats in the European Union. With angling in particular, nobody can say what it is to anybody else or what it means to someone else. But if you're into angling, then it's special to you. And when you're angling, there's many factors, for example, determination, contemplation, preparation, and all these factors can be running parallel to each other. But in my case, angling almost consumed me. The comparison I'd make is that when I was a young teenager, I was so passionate about angling that that was my only focus. And I could easily, on reflection, look back to a time when I could have just went completely 100% into angling and nothing else in, in the world would have mattered. But the reality of, of life kicked in, work, job, getting on with your life. So I'd be a passionate angler, but I'd be also functioning in the real world. You just, you just couldn't stay uh, completely consumed by it. So mum like the, the, the whole, their house and all, their land was flooded and more of them didn't, uh, part of their land was flooded. And the houses when they were abandoned, what did they do with the house? The, the houses, they, uh, they, 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 they were uh, stripped as we called it at the time. They took the roofs off of them and the doors and windows out of them and they were left in, you know, bare walls. And the ESV men came along then and they, they made holes then. They didn't stoop at all, they made holes about you know, three or four feet off the ground. Uh, with hammers and chisels and it uh, holes around, you know, every three or four feet around the house and uh, there was a genetic night charge put into them and they were blasted and they crumbled down. And of course the houses were only made of... The houses were made of, of sand and, and lime, a mortar, mortar as we call it, and they were easy to knock them and they fell down in the pile of stones. Uh, they're there today, a lot of them are there today under briars and needles and things. They the the stones. Water. Of course, I didn't want them projecting up over that's the, right. the, the right. reservoir. And that dynamiting of the houses, how do you think the people, like your own family, would have felt when they saw their own yeah, homes the, being dynamited? That, that, that was a pure devastation. I remember my father, when, when they when they blasted the house down around the quarry cross, we were still here in this house. And uh, I remember he came back in and he, he spoke to my mother and he said to my mother, Oh, Kitty, he said, Look, to the end of the world. He said, like, you know, it was, it was pure devastation. It was, you know, like, he, he, was half, he was half broken. Some of the other stumps I've looked at down around here, including the yew trees, um, they could have been anything up to a thousand years old. I mean, a yew tree can live to be 3,000 years old. 
and uh, the fact that the yew trees were here were so ancient and that's how they knew it was an ancient forest and I suppose for the sake of one meter in water levels you know all of this is is a reservoir it wasn't the major generating system and it never walked anywhere it's a white elephant so like even if you had a bit of reason at the time and if we kept the water down by meter we could have saved this huge uh, alluvial forest um, which would be still um, of huge economic benefit um, from the point of view of tourism and all the rest of it if it was properly developed. I suppose the, 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 one of the things that's important to mention is that when you appreciate the essence of what a salmon is, the beauty of the creature, the unique life cycle and all that goes with that, you then develop, it's not just about catching them, you develop a broader appreciation for the creature itself, its habitat, its life cycle, the challenges it faces, the difficulties that mankind uh, has placed upon it and you hope within yourself that for the long term future, for future generations, that the resource will still be there so that other people can get the pleasure that I've had, we'll say, from the sport of, of, of salmon angling. I mean, it's interesting and it's important to realise that the Atlantic salmon on its return journey from feeding at sea for possibly one or two winters, a reaction takes place when it comes from salt water into fresh water where its throat actually atrophies and it cannot feed. So you have this creature that's arrived in fresh water with enough nutrients, goodness, power and strength inside in it to sustain itself for possibly almost a year without feeding. That in itself is almost beyond belief. You'd ask yourself then, well if this fish can't feed, can't swallow, why, why does it take a lure at all? And then that opens another magical chapter in the methods that you can actually look to if you want to trick or deceive this fish into taking the lure that you decide to present to it. The future for me would be obviously to actually see the gear coming back and, and not just the gear like, but uh, the whole lee um, uh, getting back what we've lost. So in a sense the SB are still sitting on a gold mine um, if they knew how to actually look after this place and develop it properly. Um, but you know they actually need to, to broaden their thinking and look at all aspects. I mean originally there were electricity but now they're electricity in salmon. So you know they, they've learned to actually diversify as well and I think there's possibilities for them to diversify into eco uh, initiatives be it the salmon fishing and um, bring it back. Um, or just uh, the whole fascination of nature. I mean, the amount of people are even coming in here walking. With ancient woodland, it's, it's very unique. We cannot recreate ancient woodland. It's like trying to recreate human skin. You can't create artificial skin. You know, we can try and come up with stuff, but it won't really do the same thing. So to try and actually plant trees uh, and going in with any sort of tree, you're actually only trying to actually put in false skin grafts. It's not going to work. But what you can do is actually leave the natural forest that's there regrow just like human skin. And that's what it will do. And I uh, said, if people just stood back uh, and uh, gave it a chance and lowered the water tables, the whole gear will come back. And um, that doesn't cost any money because I don't think the dam is, has a future in itself, uh, especially the reservoir. In Ascara, will um, it'll be an important water supply for the city. Uh, it'll create a small amount of electricity, but uh, nothing uh, worth fighting over, I think. So the 
Carrigadrochid Reservoir, I think, um, at some stage, um, won't be as, as significant and it will be possible to lower the water table. If we can get men on the moon, if we can come up with the technology of mobile phones and internet and all the rest of it, surely the ability to actually build a proper functioning um, system and pass on the dams to allow the salmon to migrate up and down um, can't be beyond the, the realms of possibility. It has to be feasible and it's, you're not talking about uh, pouring money down the drain to achieve something. Uh, I think it's the economic benefit. You're talking about a, our country here, our nation, we all love it. And if we all work together and look after our environment and know how to invest properly, it would be very, very easy to actually compare with other dams, be it in the United States or Canada or whatever, where you actually can put in proper passes. To make dams more transparent to fish, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has completely overhauled its dams and pioneered some of the most advanced fish research in the world. Fish ladders allow adults to move upstream by reducing water speeds and providing more manageable in-river jump heights. Resting pools also help them move around the dams that otherwise would block their path. The Corps and other federal and state agencies have focused significant efforts on improving survival rates of juvenile fish as they migrate downstream over and through dams on the Snake and Columbia Rivers. The good news is those efforts have led to about 96% of juvenile fish on average successfully passing each core dam on the Lower Snake River and at McNary Dam on the Columbia River. Innovative efforts by the Corps to improve survival rates include design of additional passage or modifications to an existing passage route to improve fish survival. Adult steelhead and Chinook salmon have been returning upstream in record numbers. Today's increasing fish numbers reflect extensive efforts. Um, because the ones that are there do not work. And there's no point arguing with me that they do work because there is no salmon here. If they work, why aren't the salmon all around us? So it's, I know it would mean an economic investment, but I think the economic returns would actually um, be um, huge. Um, right across the board for local tourism um, and for, um, we'll say, the, the, the fishing itself uh, and the, the rights that the ESB would have to those fishing rights. The Darley Abbey project is hugely significant for the Trent Rivers Trust. It is a massive um, civil engineering and technical project. The River Derwent is a World Heritage Site, so to try and build and design a fish pass that protects the World Heritage Site but also improves the environment for fish and other wildlife is a challenge and it's one that we've met and we're really pleased to have done that. Really a river is a whole kind of microcosm of the world really and we're trying to tackle it in different distinctive ways and what Trent Rivers Trust wants to do is make that difference with all the people involved, with the, with the public, with the, the different organisations, make a difference so that our river becomes over time a better place for everybody and everything. As we move west and upstream on the River Lee, we leave the Gera and now the river reverts back to its natural condition as it always has been. However, unfortunately, too much damage has already been done 
to the natural life cycle of the salmon. And the proof of this is that there are no known runs of salmon in this area. You have to just think how economically valuable it was um, pre-hydroelectric uh, scheme there is. Um, you had two hotels in Inchigila, you had the hotels in Guganbarra, uh, you had hotels in Macroom, and uh, all the ways down the river you had anglers rest this and you had the anglers rest that. Um, the, the whole lease system was one of the most prolific salmon fisheries in Munster. Uh, and the gear obviously had a huge part to play with that. So when we look at the, the map here, we can see Loch Alua and Gugambara, which is the source of the Lee in, in, in the Sheehy Mountains. And I can imagine that salmon would have used these natural lakes to rest, possibly for months, as they do on other river systems prior to spawning. But there are no salmon in this part of the system to do this anymore.